The most important and often most challenging step in eelgrass restoration is finding an area where restoration is both possible and justified. In this video we will show you the most important steps in site selection, including mapping of vegetation and potential disturbances, assessment of the physical conditions for growth, and finally test planting. In areas where the conditions for eelgrass growth is good, meadows are often found. And in areas where large meadows have been lost, the environmental conditions may have changed so much that the eelgrass can no longer grow there. It is therefore very important to carefully evaluate potential areas for restoration and to assess the conditions with test planting before large-scale transplantation is started. Site selection starts by mapping the historic and present distribution of eelgrass. A successful restoration is more likely in areas where eelgrass used to grow, but we want to avoid planting too close to existing eelgrass beds where natural recovery can occur by itself. For the northwest coast of Sweden, present and historic data based on field surveys and remote sensing are available for free at the Administrative County Board of Västra Götaland. The picture shows the present and historic distribution of eelgrass in Hakefjord based on field sampling and satellite image analysis. Aerial photos available for free on the internet constitute a good starting point to assess the present distribution of vegetation in areas of interest. This photo shows a bay along the northwest coast of Sweden where a 40 hectare large eelgrass bed was present in the 1980s but which is now lost as seen in the photo. Today, we're also using drones to get high-resolution aerial images of an area we wish to study. We have found that uh, using, using a drone is a really good tool for site selection because it gives us a really nice perspective from the sky over a large area, which uh, is very different than being on the water surface with an aquascope or snorkeling. Using drones, we can quickly get a detailed overview of an area of interest and gather information that was previously practically impossible to get by only surveying from the water. With some basic training, modern drones are simple to use and valuable tools for habitat mapping. In addition to providing a good overview of an area, images from drones are also used to make area estimations. By including reference points of a known size in a picture or video, we can easily calculate aerial extent of an eelgrass bed. The dark patches in this picture are eelgrass beds. The square is a 12-month-old 10 by 10 meter area of planted eelgrass. All mapping done from aerial photographs or drones should always be complemented by direct field observation, using for example an aquascope or, if water visibility does not allow observation from boats, using snorkeling, diving or a drop video. This is also necessary in areas where several different species of seagrass are present and needs to be identified. Snorkeling or diving are also important when identifying different types of disturbances that can prevent eelgrass recovery and successful restoration. One common threat to eelgrass are filamentous macroalgae. Mats of filamentous algae can shade the eelgrass from light and can also cause anoxic conditions that can eventually kill whole beds. Areas where large mats of filamentous algae are formed in the summer should be avoided for restoration. Another threat to eelgrass are mats of perennial macroalgae that drift on the bottom. These macroalgae, such as the brown algae fucus, that normally grow on hard surfaces, can become detached and continue to grow while drifting on the bottom. These mats increase the turbidity of the water by increasing sediment resuspension when they drift along the bottom. They can also uproot new eelgrass shoots or cover whole patches of planted eelgrass and kill the plants. Restoration in areas with large mats of perennial algae should be avoided. If attempted, temporal meshes may be needed to decrease the disturbance such as fencing off the planted area or collection of algae prior to planting. Another threat to the re-establishment of eelgrass is the common shore crab. They can consume large amounts of eelgrass seeds and thereby prevent natural recolonization and restoration from seeds. Their digging activity can also detach planted shoots. 
In some areas, shore crabs have also been found to consume eelgrass shoots and destroy large areas of planted eelgrass. In other parts of the world, even whole eelgrass beds. When an eelgrass shoot has been attacked by a shore crab, the leaf obtains a characteristic ripped appearance. Areas where large losses of test-planted shoots occur and where the leaves show these characteristic marks should be avoided for restoration. Other burrowing animals such as lugworms could also create problems for eelgrass restoration. Seeds and young shoots could be buried so deep that they die. One of the key variables affecting growth and survival of eelgrass is the amount of light that reaches the shoots, which in turn is dependent on the water depth and the water clarity. Many coastal areas have very turbid water as a result of eutrophication and a high concentration of phytoplankton, or by high concentration of sediment particles in the water. This can cause light to become limiting for eelgrass growth even at one meter depth. Since the light conditions in shallow coastal areas can be highly variable, the best way to assess if there is sufficient light for eelgrass growth is to measure the light continuously over the growth season with light loggers. By measuring the light at two separate depths, we can calculate the light attenuation coefficient in the water and the maximum depth for eelgrass growth. To get a good estimate of the light attenuation coefficient, the instruments need to be carefully placed at the potential planting site. Place two separate light loggers approximately one meter apart vertically and measure the exact distance. The poles should stand as straight as possible and the distance from the bottom of each logger is also carefully measured. The water depth, which varies, should also be measured at each visit. The instruments should also be cleaned to remove fouling at least every second week during the duration of the measuring period. This graph shows the results of light measurements and test planting of eelgrass at multiple sites along the northwest coast of Sweden. Based on these results, eelgrass restoration is not recommended when the amount of surface light that reaches the bottom is below 25%. Waves and currents also affect the survival of eelgrass. The exposure to wind and waves can be roughly assessed by calculating the fetch from a sea chart. Another indirect way to assess this exposure is to measure the grain size of the sediment. This is a sediment sample from the bay behind me, and this is very valuable to determine how well eelgrass can grow at the site. The, the grain size will tell you how exposed the site is and if wave could be a problem. And, and the organic content and the water content tell you how well the eelgrass can anchor into the sediment and also how high the risk is for resuspension of, of the sediment that can deteriorate the water quality. Here we can see how the water is colored gray by wave-driven resuspension of sediment with a high content of clay. In the 1980s, a large eelgrass meadow was growing down to 3 meters at this site. Today, the meadow is lost and the organic sediment has eroded, exposing a layer of glacial clay that is easily resuspended, causing high turbidity. Test planting of eelgrass at a 1.5 meter depth at this site did not survive. Sediments with a high content of silt and clay that are easily resuspended can result in poor water clarity and therefore poor growth of eelgrass. Based on a large number of test plantings and measurements of grain size and light conditions, we do not recommend eelgrass restoration when the content of silt and clay in the sediment is over 50%. The last step in site selection is to evaluate the most promising sites by planting smaller patches of eelgrass and monitor their growth and survival. Yes, test planting is very important to do before you do large-scale restoration. And you should use the same method as you plan to use for the large-scale. There are many different ways to plant eelgrass, but in Swedish waters, the method that has worked the best is using a single shoot without sediment that is pushed in with your hand into the sediment. It's called the single shoot method. Using that method, you should pick an eelgrass shoot about this size. The rhizome part should be about 5 to 10 centimeters long and the shoot itself may be between 30 and 50 centimeters, as this one I'm showing you. In Swedish waters, they can grow very quickly if you use this method. They can expand maybe 10 times in the first summer in shoot density. The rhizome is carefully pressed down vertically with the top of the fingers approximately 3 to 4 centimeters into the sediment, and then pressed a few centimeters horizontally towards yourself by bending the fingers so that the rhizome is located underneath undisturbed sediment, which increases the anchoring capacity. With practice, a diver can plant up to 400 shoots per hour. 
Since eelgrass can be negatively affected by many different factors that can be difficult to evaluate by short-term measurements, it is very important to carry out test planting and to monitor the results for at least one winter season before the large-scale and therefore significantly more expensive restoration attempts are started. A test planting should be carried out at all sites considered for large-scale restoration. In areas with variable water clarity, it is recommended to leave a transect line on the bottom and to mark each planting plot with a PVC pole every 3 meters along the transect line to facilitate work. The shoots are planted within a 1 by 1 meter planting square, located 1 meter away from the poles to avoid that drift algae caught in the poles disturb the plantings. At least two transects per site should be used and placed at different depths where possible. Depending on the conditions at the site, different treatments could be included in the test such as different shoot densities or different anchoring of the shoots. Since the cost of transplantation is directly proportional to the planting density, it is recommended to assess different planting densities during the test planting to evaluate if a low density could work at a site. The plantings should be done in early summer, June, and be visited after one month, two and a half months, and 11 months the following spring so that the effect of winter mortality could be included in the assessment. All the important steps in site selection for eelgrass restoration are summarized in the fact sheet 2.7 in the restoration guidelines.